After I finished my year and my three years at seminary, I was really fortunate. Uh, our seminary offered, and I was accepted into a program that got to study in the land of the Holy One in Israel at uh, St. George's College in Jerusalem, uh, a place that our diocese here in Pennsylvania actually has a close relationship with. And when I was there, I thought I would take their flagship program that they offered, which was the Palestine of Jesus. So you know, get everything about Jesus in there. And the program started where you think you'd start talking about Jesus, talking about his life, and that was Bethlehem. First, before we made it to Bethlehem, we traveled first just outside the city to this place called Herodium. Now, Herodium would have been the palace of King Herod the Great in Jesus' time. And this was a pretty impressive palace. It was kind of more of a uh, summer vacation if you will. It was where Herod went. Um, not so much just to get away, but you know, if there was an uprising, he'd head over there and be safe. He could see things from miles, see all the people that were mad and trying to get rid of him. Uh, and while he was there, there was a big pool in the midst of this palace. There was a theater, a home theater, although then it would have been more like an amphitheater, so, you know, plays and things like that, you know, not so much the big screen TV. And also, this whole place, you know, if, if Herod didn't think enough of himself, then Herodio, after he died, it was established to be his tomb. So there was going to be this big, big funeral to celebrate him. And then finally, at the end of this big celebration, his body would be laid to rest in the middle of his palace. So now, the contrast with this is where we went next, Shepherd's Field. And Shepherd's Field is where we were told a lot of churches in the area go and worship on this very night. And it's not connected with Jesus' birth, except that it's in Bethlehem, and except that it has this area there that's meant to approximate where Jesus was born. And I want to be clear about this, because sometimes there's a little bit of confusion. <coughs> We get the biblical narrative, but we don't always understand what Luke is talking about there. So back in Jesus' day, as we just heard, Mary and Joseph's parents are getting into town. They don't know anything, so there's nowhere for them to stay. And then, you know, you go, you check the inns, the hotels, the motels, all those things. Nothing. There's no place for them stay. Because there's this huge census going on, everybody's coming home. And they're home, uh, not in the case of you know, Mary and Joseph, where they were originally from, but where their family was from originally. So Mary and Joseph have nowhere to stay. So they do what people in that day would normally do. And this was as we're there in Shepherd's Field, there's this cave that's there. And Greg, who was the dean at St. George's at the time, was telling us what would have happened, what we know from, from archaeology, what we know from Jesus' time, what would have happened to Mary and Joseph. So in that day, when you didn't have anywhere to stay, you went to a cave. And there probably would have been a lot of other people with Mary and they probably would have had a lot of livestock there with them, a lot of animals. 
So Mary, who's getting ready to give birth, wants to go somewhere where there's privacy. Makes sense, right? The only place that you can find privacy in a cave like this would have been where those animals, the livestock, were. So after she's given birth to Jesus, the only place for her to lay is a manger, which literally means a feeding trough, a feeding trough for the animals. So there's a huge difference here. You've got Herod with his great palace right outside the city. And you've got Jesus, the Messiah, who's born in poverty, who's born with parents who don't have anywhere else to stay, who's laid in a feeding trough for animals because there's nowhere else to Now, when it comes to Herod and Herodian, I'm willing to bet that when you guys walked in here this evening, you have no idea what Herodian was. And by talking about this, you're probably thinking, what? What is that? What is he talking about? And Herod himself, most of us here wouldn't know who Herod the Great is, except from the biblical narrative from our story in the Bible with the wise men. Now, Herod's palace, Herodium, shows this. It's not the great place that it once was. It's now a ruin. Just some stones packed on one another. Nothing else to signify the greatness that this palace once was. Jesus, on the other hand, not Shepherd's Field, but the place where he actually was born. There's a church there. And when we were on this trip, this church was treated very differently from what we saw in Herodium. Herodium was treated like a ruin. It's an archaeological for scholars, though, the, the few people who actually knew what the Roman was, who know who King Herod the Great was. Then you go to the Church of the Nativity. And it doesn't look like a cave anymore. Because our Orthodox brothers and sisters have built this church above it. All these things around it, icons, other beautiful images and candles and incense holders, and all these things. And they're all encrusted in precious metals, gold and silver. This is true even of the bedrock of the place. You can go all the way down in this church. And you can actually stick your hand in what would have been the bedrock for the cave originally. And even around that, there's silver encrusted around that spot where you would stick your hand. And while we were there, this place was being renovated. So there was all this scaffolding everywhere. Because this is a place of worship, a place of importance. And our Orthodox brothers and sisters are doing everything they can to preserve this place so that it lasts thousands of years more. So the place of power in Jesus' day is now a ruin. The simple, humble cave where Jesus was born into poverty is now treated like a wonderful and beautiful and precious place. <coughs> now, when we were talking about all of this, actually at Herodia, Greg, the dean at the time at St. George, said these words. And, and it's an idea that stuck with me all these years later. 
He told us the power of Messiah is found in a village, not in a palace. St. Paul puts it another way in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where he tells us that God's power is made perfect in weakness. See, this is the thing that we are celebrating tonight. This is the reason we're all gathering together. The power of God being made perfect in weakness. Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born to riches. He wasn't born into this political power system around him. He had a humble upbringing. He was raised to be the son of a toolmaker, carpenter, as some say now. Someone who made tools for those in their village all the way further north in Nazareth. This is a humble beginning. Jesus has a humble life. This is where God's power is made manifest in this world. It's not a great political power. It's not any kind of power as we would understand it. It's a power made perfect in weakness. This is at the of our faith. Because that power being made perfect in weakness doesn't just end in Jesus' birth. And let's not forget, God didn't send someone down to save us all. God came himself in the form of Jesus. God got down with us in the nitty-gritty of the dirt of it all. He was born in a feeding trough, in a manger. That's how much God loves us. God would be willing to come into this world in that humble form. And then 33 years later, Jesus doesn't come into Jerusalem, his triumphant entrance, on a horse of mighty steed, animal of great power. Jesus comes in humbly on a donkey. And he doesn't come in to celebrate a big political victory, a big battle won. No, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. That triumphant entry is for him to come and die. To die for each every one of us. To die so that the power of death might be turned backwards. And that we too, like our Lord Jesus Christ, might one day experience the resurrection from the dead. His power, His power made perfect This is what we're here to celebrate tonight. But it's also at the core of our faith. For us, power isn't found in the palace. It's found in a humble village. It's found in a cave, in a manger, even. This is where God's power is made manifest. For us all. So if you walk away from here tonight, you remember nothing else. Just remember this that God's power is made perfect in that weakness. And that that's the sign of just how much God loves in each and every one of you. Each and every one of you here. Each and every one of you that's listening at home, and each and every one of you that will watch this later. God loves you so much that he came down in the form of Jesus. And 
endured that power made perfect in weakness, so that we might all be able to experience life together with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in that great resurrection of the dead that our Lord Jesus Christ.